Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. You know, I was looking at this. It's basically released from the SSA. It's their report specifically on how their staff is doing, and it's not good. Uh, real quick mention, Diana, first uh, for the blue ribbon right there. Now, here's, here's what we need to know going into this situation. The Special Committee on Aging United States Senate, uh, they have this report that's created. They go through essentially how many employees the SSA has. You know, they look at essentially, okay, how much money do we have? How many employees do we have? What's the future of this program? What's going to happen? They do a quick analysis. They put some charts on the table to show where things are going, and they look horrible. Let's go through real quick. This is from Commissioner Martin O'Malley. He's shining a light on something that is just getting worse and worse and worse. Let's get into it real quick. All right. So the current state, this is an SSA official document. Let me just read it to you because it's incredibly serious. Social Security is serving more customers than ever before with fewer staff than ever before. Now, we knew that. They're at like 65-ish, going towards 60,000 employees. They can't hire and retain enough employees fast enough. They need around 90 to 95,000 employees to actually make this program run properly. By the end of fiscal, 20, fiscal year 2024, the SSA will serve over 7 million more beneficiaries with about 7,000 fewer full-time permanent staff when compared to fiscal year 2015. So basically what we're talking about is it keeps getting worse and worse. And the unfortunate thing is, there's no immediate fix. I mean, money's a fix. Hiring more people faster is a fix. But they're trying those, and it's not really fixing the problem. Although the money thing, they haven't really, really tried that yet. While, modernize, while modernization and other efficiencies have helped for some things, there is no way around the fact that the agency cannot keep doing more with less. The SSA's budget was essentially level from fiscal year 2018 through fiscal year 2021. Now, it went up, but with inflation... It didn't go up. That's what they're saying here. While costs continue to increase, okay, we had to make difficult decisions to cut funding in certain areas, such as staffing and overtime. As a result, we ended fiscal year 2022 with our lowest staffing levels in 25 years. So imagine that. It's not a 10-year low. It's not a 15-year low. They're at the lowest staffing that they've ever had in the past 25 years. Now, they have a graph here. And we're going to go through, I'm going to read through to you the specifics of it. So with the support of Congress, which is really just our money, but, you know, they're talking to Congress here, we received a $785 million increase in fiscal year 2023 over fiscal year 2022. So less than a billion. We use that uh, funding to begin to rebuild our workplace to better serve our customers and beneficiaries. Our staffing increased to nearly 60,000 at the end of fiscal year 2023. So. Remember, okay, they were lower than 60,000. The reports that I originally had had at 65,000 employees. They were below 60,000 and had to increase to 60,000, okay? Uh, still holding low, but better than roughly 56,000 at the end of the prior year. Now, let me show you real quick what they're talking about here. So when you look at this, right, you can see that, you know, fiscal year, let's see, right here is fiscal year, uh, where it starts to go down, it's like fiscal year 2019, right? And then 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. What you're seeing here is essentially a very scary situation where in the first time in history, look at the history of it, right? That we have here. First time in history, a dramatic, massive drop in the amount of employees that they have has caused this horrific situation where they couldn't process claims properly. They didn't have enough people to do it. They went all the way down to 55,012 people. Now, I know a lot of you guys try to call the SSA and you get them on the phone 30 minutes, 45 minutes, et cetera. I know a lot of you try to call DDS and you can't get them on the phone at all. I know that when you call the hearing office and you ask them to do something, nothing gets done many of the times. We experience a lot of that too. However, we have some admin faxes, admin phone numbers, stuff like that. But I get it. I get it. The thing you paid for is not supplying you with the service you expected. Currently, due to the extended continuing resolution that we are under in fiscal year 2024, we have stopped. This is the most important sentence in this entire thing. We have stopped all hiring and our staffing levels have already fallen below where they were in April of last year. Okay? Now, just to clarify, does that mean that it will take longer to be found disabled? 
Does that mean it will take longer to get somebody on the phone, a longer wait time to call them and have them do an interview? Absolutely. What I'm experiencing with a lot of claimants that have no expedited principles under the I-2-1-40 subsection A1 through 6 principle for expediting a claim, I'm experiencing that regular claimants are like 17 months. That's And that's mostly Central Florida. Other areas are faster. Some areas are slower. But 17 months is becoming the new standard. Was 16, now it's 17. You can expect for an initial filing level, it will continue to grow until basically probably 18, 19, 20 months. And let me read to you exactly the sentence that, that's the most important thing from this again, because this is what's really important. Currently, due to the extended continuing resolution that we are under in fiscal year 2024, we have stopped all hiring. And our staffing levels have already fallen below where they were in April of last year. If we continue this, and remember April of last year was, the, I, I'm not sure if that's exactly 55. Was that it? Let me see. Hold on. I think that's when they hit 55,012. I think they're under 55,000 employees now. All right, so bottom line, nearly 11% lower than the roughly 6,200 full-time permanent staff we averaged from 2010 through 2019. So yeah, I mean, they're below 55,000 employees now. That's incredible. That's, I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. So, you know, they got a, they got a spike problem. Similarly, the state disability determination services were able to make some progress increasing their staffing levels in fiscal year 2023 following years of record high attrition and a historically low staffing level in fiscal year 2022. But in fiscal year 2024, the DDS have quickly dropped below last year's staffing levels due to our pause in hiring giving, given the funding level, which is leading to a severe setback in addressing a service delivery crisis. So I don't know exactly what the perfect number is, you know, and it changes obviously every single day, but the backlog has got to be more than a million people at this point. I, I, I don't know what it is at the moment, but it's got to be more than a million people. Let's keep reading. SSA has extremely low operating expenses. Members may be surprised to learn that the social security has now been reduced to operate on less than 1% of its annual benefit payments. This is extremely low, much lower than, okay. Private insurance companies, for instance, Allstate operates on 19% of its annual benefit payments, and Liberty Mutual operates on nearly 24% of its annual benefit payments. Please know that I'm not suggesting that this was something done knowingly or willingly to Social Security by members of Congress, even though it was. It, it was. It was. There's certain Republicans who, who did this. Like, I'll literally, I can find you the videos where there's a Republican sitting in the chair screaming at the at the agency officials, including Commissioner Kijikazi, not screaming always, but like they, they come out like, we gave you the budget you asked for. This was the budget from this president and the increase you wanted, right? Where they're doing that stuff. And, and the amazing thing is like, people are like, for those politicians, like, yeah, save that money. Dude, this is only hurting your ability to get the money you already paid for. Like, think about it. Please know that, I, so again, see, so he's saying, right? Please know that I'm not suggesting that this is something done knowingly or willing to Social Security by members of Congress. However, Congress has not granted Social Security its own budget or appropriations hearing in nine years, which means that, to be fair, right? You know, when you see like the military ones with those, which means that the SSA, it appears, is being, in my opinion, intentionally eroded. That's what it looks like. Okay, and that's from a inside and outside based level, right? The, the millennials can't pay for the boomers, right? That's a problem. The federal government isn't willing to uh, actually fund the Social Security Administration to run properly, thereby they slow down the process of people getting disability benefits, which thereby increases the amount of people who die waiting for disability benefits, which means that they have to ultimately pay out less money from the trust funds. COVID just occurred. The numbers of those who were 85 that were on Social Security benefits that passed away as a result of COVID, very immense numbers. That helped the trust funds out significantly, which is a horrible idea, but that is the reality. And I will tell you this. Do you think anybody really, really got excited about that? There was only one nonprofit brave enough to even bring it up. That was the National Academy for Social Insurance. There was only one nonprofit out of all of them brave enough to even bring that up and go into detail and do a full analysis. Only one that I could find. 
<clears throat> Next paragraph. We can and must do better. We want to work with Congress to sustain the funding crisis, uh, funding increases in the president's fiscal year 2025 budget and beyond to enable the SSA to improve service levels and reduce wait times. Under the current system, Social Security's operating overhead as a share of benefit outlays has shrunk by 20% over the last 10 years. A decade ago in fiscal year 2015, Congress provided a funding level that represented 1.26% of benefit outlays for operating expenses, but the proportion has been shrinking over time as our appropriated administrative expenses have not kept pace with the growth in our beneficiaries and benefit outlays, like how much they have to pay out, how many beneficiaries they are, et cetera. So what they're saying is, the amount of money they have to buy printers and scanners and papers and, and, and have people work in this stuff isn't growing, but the amount of beneficiaries they have is massively increasing. In fiscal year 2023, it was down to 1.01%, and under a full year for fiscal year 2024, it will drop under 1% for the first time ever at the current rate to just 0.94% operating budget for the SSA. Now you guys might say, you might say, hey, why would it cost that much to give people money they already paid in? Well, have you noticed that it is difficult for the government to do business? When I was in my MBA, they would tell me that the government tends to be six times less efficient than essentially private markets, private corporations. Okay. They've got to follow all these extra little rules that they put in place to make the magic happen. And at the end of the day, to be fair, Let's just be really fair about this. Let's just let's just be really honest about it. The most aggressive go-getters, those are in the private industry. They're in the private industry. People who want a safe job with a continuous benefit that ultimately helps them in their elder years, that's your government employee. Okay? You got your resources, right? You got your lions. They're in the private market. They're making as much money as they can. The people who are more in the line of the, the dogs and the, and the turtles that want to be safe with their shell, that's your government people. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? It's just the way it is. It's the logic of the human brain in approaching these types of jobs, right? Somebody who wants to risk everything is not going to go into the government job. Somebody who wants to risk everything is going to go into the private market and make big money or lose big money. Sam, thank you for the dollar ninety-nine donation. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the mod as well. Please say howdy to the moderator. Right, she, she's right there in the blue. Okay, it says Social Security Disability SSI SSDI moderator. Make sure you say howdy to her. Euphoric concept. Thank you for the dollar ninety-nine donation. Let me put some hearts on these real quick. That's awesome. Very very cool. Uh, let's see what we got going on here. Uh, Euphoric concepts. I have two compassion allowance listings. What a real? What's a realistic approval time? Uh, okay, so euphoric. I have to know the general area you're in, and I can basically give you a, a general. But remember, general area. Like, give me a state and like a general county area, okay? Uh, but don't give me any details, like specific stuff like that. Okay, next thing. So, so just just to kind of ex understand this real quick, operating budget has never been good for the SSA, but it's going under one percent, and it's going to continue to drop. They're showing into 2029 at 086 percent. Now, I can hear the other arguments. The other arguments is that, well, you know, it's easier to process more people, you know, it, you know, it's like it's like two people living in a house. If two people live in a the house, they can kind of share the tasks and share the burden, and it doesn't cost as much to do it. So the amount of people you add on shouldn't cost as much for as many people to do it. I don't really see that as a true definitive answer unless you have artificial intelligence helping you in a much more in a much more active and aggressive way. Uh, going forward, because remember, now we're talking a little about little numbers here. We're talking about 70 million plus people. We're talking about $1.4 trillion. We're not talking cutesy numbers here. We're talking mega numbers. <clears throat> Our service and customers are suffering. Here's where they go into the details of that. As a result of, his, of this historic underfunding and understaffing, Social Security faces a service delivery crisis. The situation is dire. And the public we serve is paying the price as they attempt to access the benefits that they have already worked their whole life to earn. For example, backlogs in the states continue to grow. Disability applicants are waiting on average nearly eight months, 228 days for an initial decision and an additional seven months, 223 days for those who request a reconsideration. Now, when you hear eight months and seven months, obviously some of you in the comment section are gonna be screaming, hell no, that's not true. And you would be correct. 
Remember, they're averaging it. There's a lot of people who get technical denials, and the technical denials are instant, right? They don't have enough quarters of coverage. Cool. In two months, they get a denial letter. Boom. That's a decision. So you got a bunch of these super quick decisions coming in, and they're using that to offset this whole eight-month, seven-month thing. But realistically, it's around 17 months for busier areas. Right, if you're in the middle of nowhere, it could be a little bit faster, and then basically it's probably going to rush to. It's probably going to actually uh, slow down to around 18 months, 19 months. Okay. <clears throat> However, for those applicants with the most severe health conditions, we award benefits in less than 30 days. That's and that's just just to talk about euphoric situation here with the uh, compassion allowance listings. If you have two compassion allowance listings, like you know, look, I've seen. I had one compassion allowance listing person go through in two days. Uh, another one, two weeks, stuff like that. I'm not seeing essentially 30 days. What I'm usually seeing with the submission is something where it's like, you know, 45 to 60 days for somebody who obviously falls into a definitive compassion allowance listing. If the medical evidence is very specific and direct as to what they have, but if they have to wait until they reach DDS, you, you could with the compassion allowance listing level have to wait. Okay until basically, you know, potentially you get assigned a DDS rep, which could be 14-ish months down the line, maybe 12 or 13. So if you are a compassion allowance listing person, the number one thing you want to do is go ahead and on your initial application, if it's, if it's the uh, initial application that you're submitting online, you want to put in the remarks section, CALS, compassion allowance listing, here is the condition. If you're doing it on paper, right at the top of all your initial filing forms, CALS, compassionate allowance listing. If you're doing it over the phone via interview, tell them I have this disabling condition. I am a compassionate allowance listing. If you've already submitted it and you need to know what to do, go get an SSA 795, SSA 795 PDF, right into it. Sign your name, put your stuff up there, flip it over, sign your name, go back to the first page, CALS, compassionate allowance listing. And then those claims will go through much, much faster. All right, people who try to reach us by phone, are now waiting on hold for 38 minutes or more on a dysfunctional 800 number system. They still do not address the fact that many of their 800 number and their local field office people will pick up the phone, hi, this is such and such with the SSA, and then boop, hang it up. It's something that they need to look into. It's something that they need to address on these forms because it happens all the time. They answer the phone, click, they're done. They answer the phone, click, they're done, so they get to the next one. I don't know what the culture is that they're doing there. I don't know if they tell them, hey, every third phone call, pick it up and hang up. I don't know if that's the deal because remember, that will speed up the numbers, right? If they play that game, that'll speed up their numbers of getting to somebody else because otherwise they'll have to answer questions and then get to the next person. That's the game I could potentially see being played. And our agency has long strived to get the right amount to the right person at the right time, but struggles to catch erroneous overpayments in a timely manner, which can have damaging consequences for beneficiaries. Now, but still we do our very best day to, uh, every day to serve the highest number of beneficiaries we have ever served in the face of the lowest projected staffing levels in 27 years. So just to like, just to understand this, just to like put this into a comprehension based, you know, I understand it. I am, I'm aware of it. I'm cognitive of this problem. If you go back 27 years, okay, that's you're, you're pre, you're like getting into like pre, well, let me just, let me just hold on. Let, let's, let's, let's be accurate on figures that matter. Okay. Here, here, here we go. Here we go. When did Britney Spears debut? Okay, let, let's look at this. 1997. All right, all right. So 1997. So if we go back 27 years, so we got four, and then we got 20, and then we got basically three years. So that's it. That's it right there. When Britney Spears signed, she wasn't even out yet, but when she signed her recording contract with the American record label Jive Records, Okay, when she signed it, which by the way, I actually was in the music industry at that time. We've had four people now in the uh, whisper room. The fifth person, uh, a lady, is coming over tonight to go ahead and record in there. And we're going to actually record it. We're going to keep it all. We're going to shoot some video footage, all that stuff. I'm going to actually show you the video of what I've been working on. It's, it's really, really cool stuff microphones, preamps, specialty cords, plugins, all that stuff. So it's just a really exciting thing. But Britney Spears, back to 1997. That is the last time that the SSA was running properly. 
when it comes to the amount of people who are actually working there. That's how scary this is. That's how unbelievably ridiculous and scary this thing is. Okay. Now, this is how they're addressing the service delivery crisis. As soon as I was sworn in three months ago, which is from Martin O'Malley, right, Commissioner Martin O'Malley, I announced my intent to focus the agency on three key delivery service delivery challenges in 2024. Disability determination wait times, national 800 number wait times, and overpayment and underpayment inequities, okay? And, and of course, they throw the inequities word all, all around and stuff like that. But let's, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on disability determination wait times. There is when you get to DDS or DAS if you're in Georgia and you think you're cool, there is when you get to DDS, a developmental unit, which is just a fancy way of saying your claim gets dropped off there at kid's school and sits there for so many days until they hand it off to somebody to be assigned to actually work on it. So just to be fair, just to kind of give you an understanding as to why my hair is doing that, just to be, I don't know, my hair is just, it's, I don't know, had fun, had fun. So the point is, uh, point is this, okay? <clears throat> I don't know what is, come on now. Anyways, so the point is this. At the end of the day, you have to understand that these things, that ha having a developmental unit where literally they just send your claim and it sits there and waits and waits and waits. They'll send out a 3369 form. They'll send out a 3373 functional form. They might even send out the supplemental forms during that time. But you'll be sitting there for a long time. You could be sitting there five months, nine months, 10 months, 12 months, 13 months, 14 months, whatever, until you actually get assigned a rep. That's not good. Okay. So good thing he's working on that because that should have never existed to begin with. Next one, national 800 number wait times, national 800 number wait times. Okay. When it comes to calling them, there's the issue of getting them on the phone and then they usually do a hang up thing. You get them on the phone, they hang up. I don't know if it's one of those things where there's a plan for it. Like I said, every fourth person, every second person you hang up, but they do that and they need to address it. And overpayment and underpayment inequities, we actually have a video on that. I have right here a video specifically on what are the changes related to overpayments going forward. And it's, it's an important video. That will be the next one after this. Since then, I have held countless briefings with executives and staff, met with labor partners and advocates, and most importantly, I've traveled to SSA's regions across the country to meet with and learn from the dedicated employees who are tirelessly serving members of the public each day in our offices and on our phones. Now, I'm just going to point something out. Commissioner Martin O'Malley is better at playing politician than Commissioner Kijikazi was able to do. He's a better schmoozer. He's a better numbers person. He knows how to sell better. That's why Biden picked him to be the full-on, not just acting, but the full-on commissioner. Commissioner Kijikazi, though, had advantages when it comes to running a nonprofit as a nonprofit. He's going to have advantages when it comes to running this so that he can basically inspire congressional members to get it funding and hopefully gauge and manage how much work these employees are actually doing. Now, he said he stated, this is from him, Martin O'Malley, Commissioner Martin O'Malley. I conducted 10 town halls in headquarters and the regions where I was able to interact with about 2,000 employees. I visited field offices, hearing offices, present, uh, processing centers, and teleservice centers. I sat in with call center representatives taking calls and sat side by side with claim specialists interacting with the public. I heard countless suggestions for improvements, both big and small, some of which we already have begun to implement. I also made an open call for employees to submit their ideas and insights for improving customer service. And so far, we have received nearly 3,000 submissions and counting. I'm grateful to the dedicated SSA employees who took the time to submit their ideas and have begun to personally review and respond to as many as I can each week. You got to hand it to the guy. He went full-fledged, full-tilt into an insane, nearly impossible situation. Like, just to clarify, just to, just to make this make sense, okay? Just to make this essentially be something that is clarified. A man who wants to be president realizes that he doesn't have the rock star power to be president yet. So he goes to Biden and says, I will fix your SSA problem so that you can be president for another four years. But I expect, right? And I'm, I'm just assuming here, it's not, you know, I expect that he, President Biden, will support him going into essentially the next presidential run if he's picked for that for the, by the American people. That's what I expect. Taking over the agency that is hurting the most, failing the most, to prove and create rock star status to potentially be president. That is what has caused him to go to all these different field offices, all these different hearing offices, all these different regional offices, etc. 
He's been traveling a lot. I can only imagine how much he's been flying. Now, based on what I've learned, I'm going back to what he's saying here, based on what I've learned from inside and outside of the agency, including conversations with employees and customers, I have implemented numerous changes to improve both our employees' experience, sorry, employees' experience and our customers' experience with us. I like to call these quick wins or low-hanging fruit, that is, things where we have the authority and the ability to act quickly and make immediate improvements, no matter how seemingly small. Now, I want to point something out here, and I think this is important. I think this is really, really important, okay? When it comes to this situation, when it comes to this whole thing, he made a specific comment here, which to politicians, attorneys, we get it. We know what's going on. Other people, they're not necessarily going to see it. Let me read it to you again, okay? That is things where we have the authority and ability to act quickly to do these things. The SSA is a lot of red tape, but the major things that the SSA needs are not what the SSA can provide inside the SSA. Those things, more money, bigger legal changes that affect the entire program, those are controlled by Congress. So does Commissioner Martin O'Malley have the authority to do really big changes, really big funding? No, this is because, and he states here, we were able to do low-hanging fruit changes, that is, things where we have the authority and the ability to act quickly and make immediate improvements. A lot of things he doesn't. He just doesn't. It requires Congress to step in for the really big stuff. For example, during my visit, one employee in Boston identified the need for a simple technology fix to create a no to all button, similar to, to the select all within the claims taking process on supplemental security income applications. By doing so, we could reduce staff time and collect information on applicants' financial resources. We were able to implement this fix within four weeks of first hearing of the idea. Cool. Simple tech, simple uh, you know, basic coding trick completed. Awesome. Good. Low hanging fruit, get her done. Next one. Also, based on an employee suggestion, this one from Birmingham, we rolled out a nationwide expansion of a new automated Medicare process, AMP, to improve back end processing for online Medicare claims. This will reduce processing time from seven minutes to seven seconds, freeing up the equivalent of around 40 people to do other critical pending work. In one week, we implemented a fix that had been stalled since 2011. Looks good. Get her done. Good job. Here's the next one. To further increase our ability to collaborate, engage, and innovate across the agency, I announced an increase in on-site presence at SSA's headquarters and regional offices starting April 7th. SSA's field offices have been fully open to the public since early 2022 and are not affected by this change. He's doing slow changes to make sure those people working at home are making it back to the office, right? He's got to be careful because he doesn't want to mess with the morale issue because the morale and the amount of employees they have very, very low. Next one. Last month, we published formal notice of our plans to access and use information from payroll data providers. This long-awaited automated payroll information exchange, PI, will reduce wage-related overpayments by ensuring we receive timely and accurate wage data. The notice is, all, is open for public comment until April 15, 2024, and we encourage all interested parties to submit comments. It's going to really, really fix the overpayment situation because when people go work and they don't report it, they report it too late, they're going to get an overpayment. It causes a whole problem. This will fix that. They just won't get a check for that month that they're earning too much. Okay. Next one. We are also working on three final rules that will simplify and streamline the consideration of non-cash assistance within the SSI program. By taking these actions, we will increase the accessibility of these vital needs-based assistance while also decreasing overall processing time. They're looking at a lot of fixes for SSI. The main one is the in-kind support maintenance one. And the sad thing is if somebody's like giving you food, the SSA is like, oh, we saw somebody giving you food. We're going to have to take away one third of your benefits. Well, oh, I know you had 900 and something bucks. Now we're putting you down to 600 bucks. It's ridiculous. If somebody's giving you food, like that should not be, cons it's, I, I, you know, I get where it came from. I understand where the law came from. But at the same time, right? At the same time, people need food because they can't afford food. A lot of these soup cans are absolutely ridiculous now. People can't afford them. All right. Now, here are some of the uh, stats, details. Uh, on February 5th, 2024, we launched Security Stat. So what is Security Stat? Standing bi-weekly leadership meetings to track and align on key performance outcomes across rotating challenges. So this is how they're going to track how hard their SSA employees are actually working. Because let's be fair, the government employees, some of them work really hard. Some of them don't work very hard at all. I've known a lot of people who have worked really hard in this industry and made the office work. And I've known a lot of people that walked around with literally headphones on, listening to movies, 
while they were working at the hearing office. Like literally, that's what they would do. That person was also ultimately, uh, I don't know if he quit. I think he was terminated from the job. But the bottom line is this. I, I, and I don't know if he, if he quit or was terminated, but I think he was terminated. But the point is, there are quite a few employees, right, that, that don't really apply themselves. So, because let's call it it is. At the end of the day, it's not a lot of money. All right. That's, that's the reality of it. Many of you have kindly sent our, your staff to observe this new way of doing business at the SSA. Your intention, your attention, your interest in the presence of your staff at our side have been more deeply appreciated than you can know. Security stat is based on the success I had with city stat and state stat in my prior roles. I have found in my past experience that a focus on data for all combined with regular accountability and collaboration helps to create a winnable game for employees and improve performance across the board, especially in large agencies. This is precisely what security stat is about. All right. So just to make sure you, know, sure you understand, he was doing smaller politics than he was a governor, right? So hence the whole like city stat, state stat. And now we have security stat. Security stat is his thumb on the SSA to gauge how shitty or awesome an SSA employee's work product actually is. They've needed it for a while. It's a good thing. Here we go. There are four central tenets of security stat. Okay. Timely, accurate information shared by all, rapid deployment of resources, and effective tactics and strategies, and relentless follow-up and assessment. Okay. Which seems like more than four, but that's okay. Those are all good. Again, timely, accurate information shared by all, Okay, I guess that's one. Rapid deployment of resources, that's two. Effective tactics and strategies, that's three. And relentless follow-up and assessment. You know, it's like the scientific process. That's what it is. It's like, you know, how do we get your money and use a scientific process? We do it. We see how it works. We do it again. See if we get the same result. Security stat is critical because the service delivery challenge that we face, across, uh, face are cross-cutting. No one component of the SSA, no matter how well-led, can solve any one of these problems by itself. Rather, we must work together across the agency in timely, agile, and collaborative ways as never before. Okay, cool. Security stat provides a systematic and recurring method of doing that by gathering the top leaders in a room together and engaging in data-driven performance management. So let me explain what they're doing. They're Walmarting the SSA. They're figuring out how to buy products cheaper. They're figuring out how to go ahead and complete things faster. They're figuring out all this stuff. So that's important. So every two weeks, in a rotating fashion, we gather together and focus intensely on the most important things SSA is charged with accomplishing but for the American people and for you, congressional leaders. They're members of Congress. For one blessed hour, every two weeks, we focus together on each of eight key challenges. Okay, so here's, here's how it's going to work. Field operations. That's like your local field office, what they're doing. Human resources. How they're getting their employees working more. Who's in HR? Who's onboarding? Who's offboarding? National eight number number, uh, national 800 number. Okay. We all know you call it, it's a miserable process and they don't have much information to give you anyways, but it is what it is. Overpayments and underpayments. Congress is hot on the trail of the SSA about this because of the billions that are owed back to the federal government. Disability determinations, DDS. You guys know what that is. They're the adjudicators at the initial level and the uh, reconsideration level. Disability hearings, that's OHO. That's your ALJs, Administrative Law Judge hearings. Fraud, that's your OIG, Office of Inspector General with the CDI units. And notices, sending out heads up. Heads up, heads up, heads up. They need to get their email system working to heads up people. They need to get that rolling and have some way in our US-based email system where it can effectually be a true SSA-approved email or where we log back into the SSA website to see us a notice. They need to get that working better. They need to get that you know, working across the spectrum on this stuff. Okay, and they have the basics of it now, but they, they really need to take it to farther levels. On an encouraging note, I have found that there's a certain muscle memory at SSA. The senior executives and frontline managers have responded very positively to this newer, faster cadence of collaboration and accountability. What he was saying there was that the muscle memory was slow, but now people are starting to kick it up and that's good. It sounds like he's got to get morale. You know, he's got to get that ship with all the seafaring people on it to get excited again. On the first Monday of the social of the security stat rotation, we begin by focusing on field operations, the more than 1200 field offices, eight processing centers and 24 teleservice centers and make this okay, agency go. We discuss ways to reduce the attrition rates that plague the agency. Currently, 10% in the field offices and 22% among those staff answering the phones on the National 800 number. We discuss ways to improve performance, service delivery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, what he does is he goes through in this section all the improvements that he's going to make. 
I'm going to do individual videos because we're already at 34 minutes with this one, which is way too long uh, for a particular video of this size. I'm going to go through each one of these in its own videos so that you can have a better understanding as to what the field of SSA is going to look like in the future. So do I have faith in Commissioner Martin O'Malley to get this rolling in the right direction? Well, yeah, I do. It, it, it's not. Look, look, can we be fair about this? City stat was successful. State stat was successful. Social security stat will be successful. Ultimately, if he becomes president, you could have a USA stat. You could have a Meristat or, you know, I mean, that already exists to some degree, but you could have that applied more directly across the spectrum for government jobs. You could. Now, with that said, the next video we're going to be talking about is essentially what's happening with over happening with overpayments. Now, people who have SSI benefits are most likely to be affected by overpayment clawbacks, okay? These are people who are doing side jobs or side gigs or earning too much. And you guys know how it knows. You know, uh, if a kid has benefits and the parent works too much, boom, you get hit with an overpayment. If uh, a, a spouse, uh, if a, a SSI person has a spouse and they earn too much for a, that particular year, boom, you got a problem. If the disabled SSI person earns too much for that year or, or SSDI person, boom, you got an overpayment problem. We're going to be going over what their fixes are in the future to reduce these overpayment issues for people. All right. I will catch you at the next and last video of today. Then I have to go outside and work. Um, and I will catch you a little bit later. Please remember to take care of yourself. Have a fun, fun time. And I will see you in about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to grab a drink, let the dogs out, be right back, and we'll get right to it. Please remember to like, subscribe, hit the all button. And then, of course, throw some stars up. Go to Google, type in Disability Resolution Florida or Disability Resolution Law Firm. Throw some stars up. Also, as you guys know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I go live. Uh, I go live sometimes on Facebook, and, and then usually Thursday is YouTube. And the deal is this. You get to call in. You get five to seven minutes to ask a question, get an answer. You use a fake name when you call in. Remember to ask your question right up front. Do not story mode. If you need more time than five to seven minutes, like you need me to go ahead and run over hearing questions with you when you're not my claimant and somebody else is representing you, but you have a hearing coming up, that's fine. You can rent or rather you can buy a private hour. Or if you need me to figure out what your transition phase will be from working into disability benefits and you're getting ready to begin the process, that's fine. Just hire me for the hour. Or if you get a CDR for me, you're like, what do I do? What do I fill in? How do I do this? Blah, blah, blah. That's fine. Just hire me for the hour. It's cheap. It's 250 bucks for the hour. You fill out the little mini contract. It's in the bio. Easy. Every single day this week has one of those. And every single day last week has one of those. Okay. I will catch you guys a little bit later. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. Please take care of yourself, and I will see you in about 10 to 15 minutes, and we will go from there. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.